you for joining the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program today. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Chief Operating Officer at the Holocaust Center. We are honoring Women's History Month, and in just a couple of short minutes, you are going to have the privilege of hearing about several women who changed the course of World War II with their bravery. Women's History Month is a celebration of women's contributions to history, culture, and society. If there is a woman you would like to recognize, please share her name in the chat. And I'd of course like to recognize my mom who taught me to think outside of the box, as she would say. Our Holocaust Center Speakers Bureau brings the stories of women's accomplishments, challenges, despair, and even celebration to life on a profoundly personal level. The Holocaust Center Speakers Bureau has been running continuously for over 35 years. Initially, it began as a small group of local Holocaust survivors. And over the years, these stories have been passed on to their children and grandchildren. And now we have multiple generations talking about the Holocaust from firsthand experience, firsthand accounts, and also from an intergenerational lens. All of our speakers are remarkable. It's not easy to stand up in front of strangers and tell a difficult story that leaves you vulnerable. And it's not easy to condense a family history into 45 minutes or to delve into the details of a painful memory and then try to look composed as you discuss the effects of genocide on your family. For these reasons and so many more, I honor and commend all of our speakers, and I wanna take a moment to especially highlight the women on our Speakers Bureau, some who are survivors themselves and others who tell the stories of their mothers and grandmothers. Today, we are going to hear about some of the women who heeded the call to help fight against the Nazis. As Germany seemed unstoppable, Britain took an unprecedented move they recruited women to their special operations elite spy agency. 39 women became spies, sharpshooters, and undercover fighters. Their lives would never be the same and their bravery and cunning changed the course of the war. These stories were largely untold until Sarah Rose took a deep dive into recently declassified files and brought these lives to the public. I'm so honored to have Sarah Rose with us today Sarah is the journalist and best-selling author of D-Day Girls, The Spies Who Armed the Resistance, Sabotaged the Nazis, and Helped to Win World War II. And she's also the author of For All the Tea in China, How England Stole the World's Favorite Drink and Changed History. She was a news columnist at the Wall Street Journal, and her features have appeared in Outside, The Washington Post, Departures, The New York Post, Travel and Leisure, Bon Appetit, the Saturday Evening Post, and Men's Journal. We will have time to take questions from the audience at the end of the program. Please type your questions in at any time into the Q&A. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being with us today. And I hope you will start us off by telling us a little bit about your most recent book and give us a little bit of an overview for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Sure thing. So, in 1942, uh, we are looking at a world that is very different from the world prior to the war and the world after the war. This is the height of Hitler's empire. He basically commands everything from the Volga River to the, Atlanta to the Atlantic Ocean. There has not been an allied boot on the European continent since the Brits took off from Dunkirk in June 1940. So this is 1942. And Hitler is at his apogee. And every single able-bodied man in Britain has been called up. They've been at war since 1939. And the Americans have only been at war since December 7th, 1941. So they're just getting trained up. They're getting their war machine online. And Britain is hard up for bodies. They just don't have enough men. They're three years into a war that doesn't look like it's going to end. The young Americans aren't ready to fight in Europe yet. And in this moment of sort of dire straits, when there are no allied boots, when the only fight that's happening is bombers flying in and out of England that can't even reach 
Germany yet. They can't bomb as far as Germany. Uh, Winston Churchill has this idea. And the idea is, we've got nothing to lose. What if we harness the anger of occupied nations? What if we were able to train up a subterranean army? We could paratroop our guys in. They could get guns and grenades and ammunition into the hands of these people who don't want to be occupied. And then when the day comes, someday, when the Americans are ready, when the English are ready, we will return to Europe somewhere across the channel. We will land. There will be a D-Day. We don't know what day it will be. D was just a placeholder. In French, it was le jour J, for J, for J, jour. And when that day comes, this secret army will detonate. They will rise up and they will fight Hitler and they will just be ready, waiting the whole time. But they didn't have people to train this army because there weren't a ton of French speakers. Those that had been recruited were already fighting for the Allies and they needed French speakers who were native French speakers who were convincingly French and who most importantly didn't have a French passport because Charles de Gaulle would not allow French citizens to fight for Britain. He didn't want France to be a colony of Britain after the war. So they're on the hunt for bodies. There aren't enough and sort of out of necessity, Britain is forced to recruit women. And these are going to be the very first women in combat, the very first women to see combat, the very first women in uniform, basically in the history of modern warfare. And they will be trained as men are trained. They will be trained to shoot. They will be trained in false IDs. They will wear uniforms. They will answer to control and command. They satisfy all of what we consider being in the army. Uh, there were 39 of them. Five were in the very first class. And of those five, I focus on three women in this book. It's it's really an incredible story. How what inspired you to write this book, to even do the research to find these women and dig up their stories? So I knew I wanted to write about women in the military. I sort of knew that umbrella topic before I knew what I was going to write about women in the military. Um, and I was reading around. I thought I'd find some wonderful stories about the transition uh, to having female combatants, but I might find them in the uh, Vietnam War, or I might find them in Iraq and Afghanistan. Once I started asking the question, who was the very first? There's always somebody who breaks a glass ceiling. Who was the first woman in combat? Pretty quickly, I came down to articles about these women. They were the first, and they'd mostly been forgotten. Like We'd all forgotten that there were these 39 women who were wearing uh, uniforms when they were at home, who were fighting on the battlefields of Normandy, and they'd just gotten written out of history. Hmm. What what kind of work were these women involved in? Right. So these were secret uh, agents. They were specially trained. They are not first line combatants. They're not sitting in a trench with a gun. Uh, they are sabotage agents. They are paratroop agents. They are trained. They are uh, trained to uh, recruit a uh, secret army. So that's its own skill too. finding young men in France who you have to remember that when France is invaded in uh, May 1940, they don't sign a peace treaty with Nazi Germany. They sign an armistice, which means Hitler is still legally allowed to keep all of the French soldiers and all of the French officers in jail. And the officers will stay in concentration camps throughout the war. And he will sort of start sending some of the soldiers home piece by piece. But largely the men in France that were left over were either very young teenagers, not old enough to fight in 1940, or very old men, too old to fight in 1940. And you are recruiting a secret army out of these not very desirable soldiers. And you are asking them to leave their farms, to leave their families, to leave their mother and sisters and their only livelihood to go live in the woods, to train with this army, to do this unproven thing. There had always been guerrilla warfare prior to this. There hadn't been guerrilla warfare built into the plans of a modern army. 
And so these women were recruiters, they were trainers, they were, they were officers, and many of them commanded enormous troops. Some had Mackie of 15,000, others had Mackie of 10,000. I mean, they were in command during combat, armed combat. They were doing exactly the same work men did. They were initially hired mostly to be couriers and uh, ultimately wire, uh, wireless telegraph operators. So they were communications agents. But over time, they very quickly realized that wasn't enough of a remit. It wasn't a big enough job. They started building their own circuits and building their own networks and doing exactly the same job men did. So Sarah, I would think that considering the time, there would certainly be um, leadership or even the soldiers that they're trying to train or work with who would just not want a woman in charge who would push back against this idea of recruiting women for these jobs. Was, was that? Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. Yeah. There is this notion that war is fought for women and children and that women's bodies bring life and not death. There was a ton of chauvinism, but they were hard against the wall. There was no male left to recruit. And so this went actually all the way up to the top. Uh, no one really wanted to sign orders to send a woman into combat. No one wanted the, liked the idea of a woman coming home in a casket. Uh, and ultimately, it got to Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill signed off on it. He said uh, he had a daughter, uh, Mary Churchill, who was on a gun site in Hyde Park. And she's pulling the trigger on these guns that'll take down Messerschmitts, right? She's killing as well. And he says, you know, a gunner is a gunner is a gunner. Like, do I care if it's a male gunner or a female gunner? And any general who could save a battalion's worth of men for the front by recruiting women should be given a medal. Like, why wouldn't we try this? We don't have any choice. And if they want to do it and they want to come willingly and they know what they're signing on for, let's give it a shot. And it worked. I mean, it worked really well. They were extremely good at things like recruiting. Uh, women are trained to be listeners. Women are trained to be nurturers and caretakers. Recruiting a 15-year-old boy to leave his family farm, to live in the woods, to become a secret soldier requires a great deal of listening and are cajoling. And it turns out just that was a skill that women had natively that male agents had to learn on the ground. Well, you touched on some, you touched on the fact that these women really had to leave a lot of their existing lives behind in order to take on these new roles. And I feel like one of the women that you profile in the book, Odette, is just an incredible example of this. I mean, she's remarkable. Um, can you tell us a little bit about her? And also, how is it possible that she is not more widely known in our circles of history or in our history books. I mean, she's just an incredible, incredible figure. She's extraordinary. So Odette is a young mother of about 30 years old or uh, even younger, come to think of it. She um, has three daughters under the age of six and she gets a call from the war office. There had been a, a sort of call out on the radio. If you have pictures of coastal France, if you have holiday photos, send them to us. The Bodleian Library had an entire department that was trying to put together an image of the coastline of France from wave height because they knew that someday when D-Day occurred, it would hit the coast of France. And there was no reconnaissance plane that could give you that image that you wanted of what a beach might look like from the nose of an approaching landing craft. So they ask all of these Brits, if you have taken a holiday in Normandy, if you have taken a holiday in Calais, send us your family photos. Uh, we'll take pictures of them and then we'll mail them back to you. So she sends in, she's French, uh, she sends in family photos. She sends them to the wrong branch of service. It was in fact the Navy that was asking for these and she didn't send them to the Admiralty, she sent them to the Army. Somehow, the idea that this woman who was brought up in France, who was about the right age for what they were looking for, gets down to the recruiting office and they call her in. They don't really tell her what job she is being called up for. What they say to her is, you have a skill. You alone have a skill that could change the balance of the war, that could tip the fight against Hitler. 
would you sign on? Mm -hmm. And I think if anybody anywhere got this call from a government they loved that said, you alone can help us win this fight. And, and we've been searching high and low and you have the skill. We would take it seriously. And she did. And in her uh, interview, it sort of dawns on her what she's being called for. They want to parachute her into France as a secret agent. And she has these little girls. And no one would blame her if she stayed behind to be a mother to her little girls. Her husband is off at the front too. She could potentially be orphaning them. And what she did fascinated me. She didn't answer yes or no, or what an adventure. She answered entirely in the language of motherhood. She says, what kind of mother would I be? What kind of hope for a life would my daughters have if all of Europe falls to Hitler and Britain falls too, right? The last hope island, the last democracy in this Europe also were taken over by Hitler. What kind of a future would that mean for my little girls? And so she is motivated out of motherhood to sign up and to train to become a secret agent. And so she becomes a member of that very first class to be trained and sent into active combat. Hmm. So Odette is really one of three, um, three main stories that you have in your book. And there were 39, as you pointed out, 39 women um, who were selected to be part of this special operations executive unit. How did you pick these three? And I'm curious kind of who got left out? So I was picking from a class of about five and I picked three and I chose Odette and Andre and Lise uh, for, because each of them really impacted the outcome of the war in their own way. Uh, Odette turns out to be not much of an agent. Uh, she doesn't receive a lot of weaponry. She doesn't train a lot of people before she's captured. She's captured within a few months of uh, landing in France. And that's, everyone who lands in France is brave. Everyone who cap gets captured, it's not because they're a bad agent, but she just doesn't get enough time to get much done. And, uh, but as she's captured, she comes up with this sort of brilliant lie that will save her life and the life of her commanding officer. And that is, her commanding officer was named Peter Churchill. And they're captured together. They're having a love affair. They're captured together in the Alps. And as they are captured, she says to her jailers, this is Peter Churchill, and he is a nephew of Winston Churchill, and I am his wife. And in that instance, she creates this lie that turns her into a high-value diplomatic prisoner instead of a spy. And spies in this point in the war, uh, Hitler has already given what's called the commando order. If you are caught as a saboteur, you are not permitted any of the privileges of prisoner of war. You are not covered by the Geneva Conventions. If you are caught as a secret agent, sabotaging things, training up secret soldiers, we get to murder you. We get to torture you. We will hide your existence. We will disappear you. He has already uh, preemptively given uh, he, he commuted sentences. He's, he's, he's uh, for all of his officers who might commit some war crimes now and in the future. So he's like, just do it. Just make it, teach them a lesson. And so had she not come up with this lie when she was captured, she would have been disappeared. She We would never have heard of her again. We might not know what happened to her, but she did come up with this lie. It saved her life and it saved uh, her commanding officer's life, Peter Churchill. And she was in prison then in both France and in Ravensbrück, which was the largest concentration camp in uh, for women's concentration camp, but the largest women's prison in history. Uh, for over two years, she was in uh, solitary confinement for over three months. And uh, when she got out, because she was this high value VIP 
instead of being sent straight to the ovens or on a death march, the commandant of Ravensbrück takes her as his personal prisoner. And they are, this is the end of the war, 1945, uh, the concentration camps are being liberated by approaching armies. From the east, there's the Soviets, and from the west, there are the Allied armies. And Fritz Surin, the commandant, says, I definitely don't want to be captured by the Soviets. And he puts her in a car, and he starts driving east towards Belgium, west towards Belgium, with Odette, and surrenders to the Americans. And she is there, and she is able to say, he's the commandant, he's not just some average German. Also, she goes... He has material in the back of his car that will help convict him at war crimes trials that she takes back to Britain with her. And then she goes back to Hamburg in 1946 to testify against him. He's one of the world's worst war criminals, and she helps put him away behind bars. So she takes one of the worst criminals in the Nazi party at, and gives testimony against him. She puts him away. So... Though she wasn't a tremendous special agent, she had incredible inner strength. Two years in concentration camp, three years or three months alone in solitary confinement. And at the end of all this, uh, as broken, emaciated, and sick as she was, she was able to both help capture Fritz Surin and then testify against him uh, at trial. So she really impacted the war crimes trials. Uh, Andre Borel, who I also chose, uh, she was another young woman out of France, and she was scrappy. She was poor, uneducated, left school at age 14, and had already been working in the resistance. Uh, as you know, that when France uh, surrenders in 1940, the armistice says half of France will be occupied, the northern half of France and the coastline by Nazi Germany. Vichy France will remain free under Marshal Patin. And so she's living in Paris. She goes south of the demarcation line into Vichy, and she starts working on what's called a body line. She starts helping escaped airline uh, bombing pilots and crew uh, over the Pyrenees, out towards Spain and Gibraltar and back to England. Because while there are no armies in the continent for the first several years of the war, your bomber pilots and your bombardiers are the most important soldiers you have, the most important warfighters, the most important anything. They're the only ones who can take the fight to Europe. To lose one to a concentration camp or just because he's trapped in France and doesn't know how to get out is losing a real asset for the Allies. She was part of a line that got these guys from farmhouse to farmhouse to farmhouse all the way out of France and back to England so they could be put in a plane again. And she was so successful at it that one night she helped liberate 50 Allied pilots off the beach in Antibes to help get them back to London. So Andre was good at underground work when she was recruited for SOE. And uh, Charles de Gaulle, she wouldn't take her into his special operations uh, unit because she refused to help him. She refused to give up her team who was still operating in France. She wouldn't give the passwords. She wouldn't give up their secrets. De Gaulle says, we don't want you. And the allies say, well, we'll take you. We'd love to train you up. She will become the very first female paratrooper ever. She goes in in November 1942, uh, paratrooping into just an empty farmland in France, and uh, she is sent to Paris. We don't know in 1942 where D-Day will hit. We do know it will happen north of Paris. We do know it will happen somewhere on the Channel Coast. All of the networks along that coast were connected to the hub at Paris. The Paris networks ran those, all of those maquis, all of those fanned out little armies were controlled, commanded, supplied, thought out, planned from the Paris network. And Andre Borel was basically a number two in Paris. And she got there ahead of her organizer. She was the first person on the ground for that Paris network setting it up. So when D-Day comes in 1942, a hundred percent, wherever it comes, will come to one of the daughter networks that Andre Burrell helped seed when she arrived. 
Um, and so she was just an extraordinary player uh, and she got so much off the ground. She too will get captured, but she accomplishes quite a bit. She gets the infrastructure of the underground working before she is arrested uh, about a month after, uh, sorry, and about a year before D-Day uh, in 1943. And then I was telling these stories and I was telling them chronologically with everything building up to that big day, because that's how France is living at this point. They've been occupied by Hitler. They're starving. France has the lowest calorie count of any occupied nation in Europe, this place where there's all this amazing food, none of the French people could eat it. It was all being sent to the Eastern Front to feed Hitler's armies. And uh, as I, they're all counting down, they are all hoping for D-Day is this real day for them that is going to be their day of liberation. No one knows when it's gonna come, no one knows where it'll come, but everyone is looking forward to the day where they get to cast off the German yoke. And as I was reading about this, recognizing that like really the drum beat is towards this big day, I realized that there was a female SOE agent who was in command of troops in Normandy on D-Day and we had never heard of her, right? Like for me, that was the big like scales falling from my eyes moment as I was researching this. She had 20,000 troops in her command, she was number two when the allies landed <laughs> and we had lost her name completely. And not only that, D-Day is one day, we, it's the day we all know about, but in fact, the breakout into France takes all summer. It starts on June 6th, it goes all the way into August. They are not liberated until the end of August. And it is a fight, it is a bloody, bloody, grim, grinding fight that whole time. And all of that fight took place in Lise de Bessac's territory. So when D-Day comes, a, an alert goes out on the radio, on the BBC radio into France. And it is a signal to all of those networks and all of those trained maquis, all those 15-year-old boys and all those 50-year-old men who have been learning to like plant explosives under a train and saw down trees and take down telegraph wires. And the alert says it's June 5th before a single boot has landed on June 6th. Tomorrow is the day. The, the attack is coming in the morning. And from the moment that alert goes out on the BBC, there will be 950 cuts on roads and bridges blown up and train lines blown up and Trees felled across major arteries, and most importantly, telegraph wires will be taken down. Uh, telephone wires will be taken down, sorry. And uh, all of the communications will be blown up where they can be. Uh, telephone boxes. And Normandy in the morning will be isolated. You can't get trucks to Normandy on June 6th. You can't get, importantly, tanks to Normandy on June 6th, a trip that ought to have taken Hitler's panzer divisions mm -hmm. through six days, three to six days to come up from the South to reinforce the Normandy beaches takes three weeks. And that's an essential three weeks. That is a three weeks in which D-Day might've failed and all the allies got blown back into the water and the Americans turned their attention to Japan. And we don't know that war takes many years longer. But instead, the French resistance was so successful that they were able to isolate Normandy, stop Hitler's panzers from reinforcing, and also rise up and harry Hitler's armies from the rear so that when they're uh, retreating through France, they lose a lot of function as well. And that's all happening in Lise de Bessac's territory, and we didn't know about it. Hmm. And we didn't know about it for a couple of reasons. Um, I might give you another chance uh, to ask a question before I go on to my next spiel. So, <laughs> no, 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 please keep going. Okay. So, one thing is uh, we didn't know about it because spies are supposed to be secret. So, there's always just a lack of documentation when it comes to this stuff. And another way is we actually had known about it the whole time. 
if you watch James Bond and you have heard of Miss Moneypenny, she was based on a real character in SOE named Vera Atkins. And so we'd in fact been listening to SOE stories our whole lives. We had been hearing about this secret agency that employed women as spies. It had just been romanticized and turned into this sort of like glorious tale of an international bachelor. We, but Vera Atkins was real. Money Penny was built on her. Ian Fleming was an intelligence agent and then agent in the Navy, and he knew all about SOE. And he based his stories on them. So in some ways, we had actually been hearing about them our whole lives. We had just heard them as secretaries and sort of off into the corner. And third, um, most war history is written by men. Certainly most battle history for the first 80 years was written by men about men. And I don't want to take anything away from the men who are on the beaches with the guns in their hands, but they weren't the only ones there. Men weren't looking for them. Men were looking at male stories and men were looking at generals. And you have to get a lot more granular to see the women in these stories. And then the fourth reason is because it was embarrassing. It felt embarrassing to... Britain to have needed to use women. It felt extremely embarrassing to have lost women. 13 women died in concentration camps. And that for a nation that considered itself a global war power for 500 years was incredibly humiliating. Um, on top of that, there were also just sort of issues at the end of the war. A male agent who is captured by an enemy army can sort of rip off his civilian clothes show his uh, status in the army and say, voila, I am a prisoner of war. You must treat me according to the Geneva Conventions. A woman is not covered by the Geneva Conventions. She didn't have any of those privileges. And when the 13 died in concentration camps, it made it very hard to find them because there was a mechanism for finding soldiers. You tell the Vatican, you tell the Red Cross, these are the soldiers we're looking for. Uh, your enemy is required to say, yes, they're, those names are on our rolls and let them know that they've been captured. There was no mechanism whatsoever for women. And so it became very hard to find them. Some of them probably died while they were being looked for, which is also embarrassing. And um, yeah. And then lastly, we because after the war, women were written out of war entirely, we no longer had women in combat up again. And like there was a combat exclusion until the 90s. The fact of these women just got written away because our forces were male only for the next 50 years. Um, and then lastly, some of it is on Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle was leading a humiliated France at the end of the war. He liberated a France that had collaborated with Hitler. And he needed to tell a story in which we weren't a collaborating nation and we weren't a humiliated nation, but in fact, we were a powerful, virulent nation. And the way you project power is not to say, and women help save us. You write the women out of the story. And to this end, he also wouldn't allow himself to be photographed as he's liberating the Champs-Élysées. He will not allow himself to be photographed at all with Black African soldiers who made up a bulk, a significant chunk of the liberating armies of France, certainly all the armies in North Africa. There will, he didn't want a single photo of him with a Black man because that too interrupted this narrative he was trying to project of a strong nation and a and so some of it was the storytelling that nations do at the end of the war left women out of the story. Yeah, you bring up so many um, really great observations about kind of the multiple layers that sort of led us to why we haven't heard these stories and why they sort of remain under the radar even today. Even as women are now writing these histories, it's like, um, resurfacing some of these older stories takes a lot of extra effort, I think. Yeah. And um, look, men just aren't interested in making that effort, the vast majority of them. Mm -hmm. They are looking at the tanks. They're looking at the generals. They see a great man frame of history, which is what we're taught, which is what we're told, you know, most of us in school. You really require reframing it and centering women on 
And once you do that, the stories explode. They're everywhere. But it actually took moving the lens and putting them. We know that women are participants in history. No women have been in history. At every single moment in history, there has been a woman there, <laughs> just by definition. Not enough people have been looking for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, right, looking for them or, as you said, framing this history from that perspective so that not just looking at them, but hearing about their experiences in their voices. Um, I wonder, just to look back at this history a little bit and these women in the moment, to what extent do you think they were aware of the broader events that were going on around them and specifically um, what the Nazis were doing to Jews in France and elsewhere? Were they, um, did they, did they have that information? So they had a lot of information. Um, for instance, when Hitler marches into Paris, all the Jews that are, they start to be um, sent to concentration camps in Drancy, that it, it, it begins almost right away. Um, in 1942, you have the Val de Vive, which is uh, this awful story in Paris where uh, they put 3,000 Jews, they round them all up in a series of, you know, arrests or razzias or pogroms, uh, and they put them all in a academic, uh, not academics, or athletic complex, and they're there for days with no water, no food, babies, uh, it's absolutely horrific, and there's no way to hide. If you try and imagine putting um, you know, 3,000 people and locking them in a giant stadium, and like that isn't, there's no way to make that invisible to a city like Paris. So they knew. And uh, and Marshal Patin, when he was in charge in Vichy before November 1942, Hitler would say, oh, somebody killed a, a German soldier. I want 50 hostages in exchange. He had this very brutal sense of for, you know, if they put one of, it was like that Elaine Ness thing, right? You know, they put one of yours in the hospital, you put one of theirs in the morgue. They put one of yours in the morgue, you put 50 of theirs in a concentration camp. That was Hitler's calculus. And Marshal Patan and the Vichy government said, well, to prove that we still have national sovereignty, we're not going to let the Nazis choose who goes. We're going to choose who goes. We're going to choose the Jews that we send to Auschwitz. So it was known too. It, none of this was done under cover of darkness very well. Um, as of 1941, and then into 19, certainly by 1942, but as of 1941, we start the West getting intelligence reports of the Einsatzgruppen in the East, mass deaths, ghettos, slaughters. Um, and then the concentration camp program is starting to build too, uh, through 1941 and 1942 and is really coming online. So by December, 1942, everyone knows people have snuck out of Auschwitz with reports. All of the data is there. Uh, there are these international moments on the radio saying we know what, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Jews are being killed. And it's in the East. Uh, it's all now just the general government of the East that Hitler has taken over. But the fact that this is happening is well known throughout the nation and everybody can listen to the BBC. The radio couldn't be so scrambled that you couldn't get BBC. You were getting BBC in almost all the occupied nations. And then also Jewish communities themselves knew because they still had relatives back home, right? If you are a French Jew, it wouldn't be so surprising that you had cousins in Vienna or Berlin. If you were a Jew in Denmark, you remember your family in Lodz or, uh, and you're getting notes. Oh, the winter is so cold. Oh, we are so hungry. Oh, send this package to our new home in Theresienstadt. So the Jewish communities who had been doing just basic charity to their families through synagogues, through women's societies, they had a pretty decent inkling of how bad things were getting. I don't think we knew the scale or the mechanization of it until after the war, but in terms of numbers, yes, it was pogroms against Jews, and that was commonplace knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, um, 
the women that you profiled and many of the others, they left their lives, like their family lives, their home, their like life as they knew it to do this kind of work. Can can you tell us like what what did they do when the war ended? How did they go back to those lives or did they go back to those lives? What what did they do afterwards? So I'll focus on our three uh, to begin with. So Odette survives the war and Odette survives the war, gets a discreet divorce from uh, the husband who is the father of her three girls and marries Peter Churchill. And uh, she becomes a kind of celebrity in Britain. She's French, she fought for England. Uh, she married her commanding officer. She helped him survive with this patriotic hero's name. And, uh, but she wasn't, and, and the war office uses her to tell the story of SOE. Uh, SOE was brand new under the sun. And so having this one character who's very flashy, she's very dramatic, she's very beautiful, who you can hang it on. They write her biography for her. The war office does uh, a movie based on the biography with called Odette uh, comes out in the early fifties and the King and the, his uh, queen are there and Vera Atkins is there. Odette, Peter Churchill, they're all there for the debut. It is a grand gala affair. And she's sort of the happy story. The woman who came home, who fought for two countries and united them uh, out of her love for both. And she was as famous in her day as Princess Diana, uh, sort of a one word name. You said Odette and you knew you were talking about Odette Sanson. Uh, so she lived the life of a, celebrated war heroine. She's the very first woman to have gotten the highest, uh, they created a new award in Britain for civilian gallantry. They always had one for military gallantry, but this was a war where the Blitz came home, where there were bombs being dropped at home, where women were firing on the gun sites, and they created a civil award for bravery. She was the very first to receive it, though she was doing exactly the same job as men. They got military honors. She got civil honors. And some of the women afterwards said, there was nothing civil about what I was doing. I was fighting Nazis. Um, and ultimately, these wards would get converted to military awards posthumously. But uh, she was very famous in her day for her romantic story, for coming back alive, for being a heroine who united Britain and France. But she wasn't fit to work. We also have her medical files. She was tortured she was severely sick. She had broken her back. She had all the kinds of nutritional diseases. And so she was on a 70% military uh, pension for the rest of her life. And basically she was also had severe PTSD. It doesn't get talked about. It wasn't British to talk about the war. It wasn't British to talk about your feelings, but it's very clear looking at her medical fire files that she was not, she did not come back in good shape. Uh, that said, she seemed to have lived a happy life. She enjoyed being a celebrity. She was a very romantic, uh, kind of narcissistic person. She raised her daughters and they're devoted to her. And uh, she ultimately did the marriage to Peter Churchill didn't hold, but she married another SOE agent and that lasted in deep into old age. So she finally, you know, she had fulfilling romantic relationships as well. And she was the face of SOE up until about 2003 when the files get declassified and everybody can talk about it. Hmm. Uh, uh, Andre Burrell, she does not survive. She is captured and she is actually, she is at one moment in jail with Odette, but because Andre Burrell is just considered this French girl who was trying to murder Germans, um, and she is treated as a saboteur. She's sent to the only concentration camp on French soil and a month after D-Day, uh, when Hitler is feeling very retributive, uh, all of those women are, uh, murdered in the concentration camp. Lise de Bessac lives into old age. Um, Lise was, she's Mauritius, which means a Mauritian. She was born on an island off the coast of Africa that was a coaling stop that captured in the Napoleonic Wars. So it was French speaking, 
but she had a British passport. And she'd been living in Paris and considered herself Parisian in every single way uh, until the invasion of France, at which point she is now an enemy alien. She ends up in London, a place she didn't know uh, and had never lived and didn't really feel comfortable just by virtue of not wanting to be put in jail in France uh, with having the wrong passport. When the war ends, she has no love necessarily for London. France is her home, French is her native language, but uh, the, she was the most successful female agent in the agency. And like some other women, uh, some women in her class, they decided to keep female agents kind of on the books, on an unofficial whitelist. They hooked them up into careers after the war. Lise would become a journalist for the BBC and lived into old age. Journalism has always been kind of a great cover for spooks and spies. And as long as she was working in this quasi-journalistic capacity, if we needed her again, say against the Soviets, here was this experienced agent who could train other agents who could be used in future actions. Um, and so Lise was worked as a journalist till the end of the war, but in this capacity of we had our eye on her and we could call her up if we needed to. Another one from her class, Jacqueline Nearn, I uh, became uh, part of the first uh, consul to the UN, and she worked for the British uh, mission to the UN for the rest of her life. Again, diplomats and spooks are very much often the same people. And so she did that and lived into old age. So if you were particularly successful, SOE also became your employment agency. Hmm. Um, Sarah, we have so many questions coming from the audience that I want to make sure that we get to a few of them. And one of them that a few different people have asked is, can you tell us about the research that you did for this book? And how did you also get access to these files? Sure. Well, so some of the research was, I looked at them and these were ordinary everyday women. They weren't athletes. They weren't in some kind of military like scouts beforehand, they were just women off the street who happened to speak native French. I don't speak French. I hadn't spoken French at all ever. So I had to learn French. <laughs> and then I also thought, well, I'm an ordinary everyday woman. <laughs> and could I do this? Uh, so I signed up for a boot camp trained by a former Navy SEAL. It was extremely hard. And no, I could not do that. <laughs> I, um, I, if they could jump out of airplanes, well, by golly, so could I. And I jumped out of an airplane, uh, which I would never have done in any other circumstance and will never do again. Um, so I, and then I also felt like I needed to walk every inch that they had walked. I wanted the book to feel lived in. I wanted it to read like a narrative. I, everything is true. A hundred percent of the words and quotes were spoken by somebody written down or oral history but I wanted to read like a novel, which meant I had to experience all of these French towns and all of these apartments, if I could, and all of these hotel rooms in exactly the same way they had. So I went on a mission to just walk in their footsteps. And so that is how I built the kind of living feeling in the book. And then the files were all declassified in 2003. And uh, there is a entire industry of hobbyists who love these files. They are 100% men. Some of them are scholars. Some of them are just retired uh, military nuts. And I went around meeting them. I sort of did this diplomatic mission where I went and met the sort of important names. And many of them said, well, you know, the women didn't really do anything. They were just couriers. It was the men who did all the heavy lifting. They had just moved messages from place to place. And I was like, yeah, but they parachuted in with guns. You're not telling the story, right? <laughs> like, so I met all these guys, many of them respected scholars in their field who told me that the women hadn't done anything. And, and then I got access to all the files. I spent years and years in those files, reading everybody's file, trying to put together. When a network falls apart, it's very hard to see what, uh, what gave it away. Who was the, what was the leak? What was the link that fell apart? And so trying myself, though these stories had been written by the military nuts, how do, where, where were the weak points? How did it fall apart? And so it was a lot of time just spent in these files. And what's wonderful 
about the SOE files, and I, wonderful, I guess, should be in quotes, is that they were, SOE is decommissioned after the war. After 1946, it doesn't exist. They have MI5, they have MI6, but this kind of extra military, extra civil organization disappears. Um, it's not good for civil society to have a military organization that answers to nobody but Churchill. And all of their files stop. Um, in And then they're just put away for another 70 years untouched. So you have these beautiful kind of slices of the war day by day as they're being lived. What people were thinking, what they thought would happen. It's not informed in any sense by retrospect. They don't know how it's going to end. They don't know where D-Day is going to land. And so I got to live through the war in real time by reading the files going forward. Hmm. Um, Sarah, there's another question here. This one comes from Martin specifically, who asks, did many or any of these women get together to share their stories and lives with each other after the war? Interesting. So after the declassification, uh, you have a couple of things that happen. One, you can talk about them. You can ask them anything. They're no longer, uh, obligated by the, uh, official secrets act they're not going to go to jail for mentioning things that happen behind enemy lines um but two the publication of charlotte gray comes out and that novel uh brings the attention back to these women it also became a movie with uh kate blanchett and and when that came out, there are a number of documentaries, the real Charlotte Grays, where they realize this is a diminishing resource. These women are in their 80s and their 90s. And if we don't get their stories down, we will lose them entirely. So a bunch of documentarians at that point, a number of like scholars at universities went specifically to record their stories. Were there reunions? Up until I was researching, um, every year in May, in on the anniversary of the first paratrooper to land in France, there would be a gathering of SO enthusiasts, former SOE agents in France, um, and Fanny's, the uh, women's auxiliary that sort of provided cover for this. They would all go to a ceremony in France, read the names of the fallen agents who didn't come home, and it's very moving. The last one I went to, there were there was one male agent left, and then a woman who had been in the secretarial pool, kind of an SOE. Uh, and they were the only two that remained uh, who were still sort of able to travel. As far as I know, those memorials still keep going. And I think when they started in the 2000s, there were many more uh, veterans. But there, as far as I know now, there's almost, I can't think of it, one left. Mm -hmm. So we have lost the living memory, but there was enough of a window at the end where they were celebrated, their stories were recorded, we have them on video, and they were interviewed, and their stories were told. So we have a lot of documents from them firsthand. Though again, no spies allowed to keep a diary. So everything we have is is filtered through the memories of years. That's so wonderful. I want to read you one comment that just came in from Laura, who writes, the book was absolutely fantastic, riveting with extensive scholarship, be sure to read the notes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Sarah, will you, here's my last question for you before we wrap it up. And that is, can you tell us about a project that you're working on now and what we can look forward to coming next? Yes, we can. I am working on a book about Denmark in World War II, which um, this is a population that probably knows a lot about it, but is a little known story um, elsewhere outside of the Holocaust research community and outside of the Jewish community. And that is Denmark rescues everybody, right? 99% of Denmark's Jews are going to survive the war. 95% of them survive with asylum in Sweden. About 400 Jews do end up in Theresienstadt. But, uh, it is a really extraordinary story of a nationwide spontaneous resistance to Hitler. And when you look at other border nations with Germany that did not resist, that did not have this sort of spontaneous movement towards kind of civil society, looking at what Denmark did and how it got it right and what moments in the chain, what the decision points were that made for this success, 
Um, I focus on two characters. One is the physicist Niels Bohr, who also, he has a Jewish mother. He escapes uh, courtesy of the underground in particular because he would be a very valuable prisoner for Hitler's uh, atomic bomb project. And when he gets to Sweden, he does not leave for Britain immediately. Ch Churchill has a plane waiting for him on the runway, but he says, no, I, I can't go. I can't go until I speak to the king. And Niels Bohr kind of goes on this one man diplomatic campaign to speak to the king of Sweden to try to get him to offer asylum to all the Jews. Because from 1933 to 1943, no nation on earth has just opened the doors and said, come on in. Hitler takes power in 1933 and you see a series of laws around the world, tightening visas, you know, keeping the Jews out. Uh, the world was divided into places where uh, Jews couldn't live and Jews couldn't enter for 10 years. And after Bohr's meeting with the king, the king gets on the radio and he says, the doors are open. And that is the moment where you get this Jewish Dunkirk, all the fishing boats, all the herring boats all in Denmark are now loaded with Jews, night after night after night, under cover of darkness, shipping off to Sweden, where they are given blanket asylum and they live till the end of the war. And I'm focusing on another character and she has four children, three of whom are still alive and I've been interviewing them and getting their stories down and we'll be telling the story of this family too and how they escape. So that mm -hmm. is the Danish escape and hopefully 2025 we'll see it on shelves. Can't wait. It sounds remarkable. And Sarah, I, I know for myself and I think I speak for probably everybody who's on here that we are so grateful that you bring this perspective of history to the greater public so we can see it from a, a more well-rounded perspective, so we can see it from all these different angles and just have a better understanding of what was going on. And so that we can remember these women and all of their work and bravery and you know how they are the result of what we have today. So Thank you so much for your just in-depth research and your excellent engaging writing to bring these stories to life. It's an absolute privilege. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending today and for more incredible stories. Please join us this Sunday at the Holocaust Center with uh, Ferris Cassell, who will be discussing her award-winning book called Inseparable. It's the story of twins who survived 15 months in Bergen-Belsen. That's at two o'clock this Sunday at the Holocaust Center and details are on our website. Our next Lunch and Learn program is on Tuesday, April 9th, as we rec recognize Genocide Awareness and Prevention Month with activist Rushan Abbas, who will discuss the genocide of the Uyghur population in China and her efforts to mobilize the US government and the general public to stop the human rights atrocities that are occurring there. And again, that's April 9th, Lunch and Learn program online. I wanna thank our entire staff. It's because of them that we can do all of this work uh, Richard Green, who helps to run these Lunch and Learn programs, Dee Simon, our CEO, Paul Regelbrug and Branda Anderson, Jessica Michaels, Lori Werschel cohen Morgan Romero, Lexi Jason, Amanda Davis, Katie Lawrence, Michael Langberg, Olivia Teague, Mar Mario Philippe Bamonte, and Lisa Spink. And thank you also to Verizon and the Conference on Material Claims Against Germany for their support of this program. I'm wishing you all safety and security and a good rest of your week. We look forward to seeing you at the next program. Thank you.